If you do that, then each of you may be personally responsible for destroying meaning in a galaxy of 400 billion suns, potentially forever. Have a nice meeting, <laughs> was my it's message It's the best intro them. ever. How important is space travel in terms of our longevity as a human race? Is it essential? Yeah, um, it is. It, it, well, so, I mean, you could say, well, it's going to be essential eventually, but it's essential now, actually. So if you look at the way our civilization works, a large amount of the things we take for granted are delivered from space. So there's a number. I think there was a, a report from the Royal Society, which is the UK's big oldest scientific society, about a year ago. And I think the number is 16% of UK GDP requires space-based infrastructure. Yeah. It's a very big number. And, and because if you think about it, we use it for all our communications. We use it for the timing of our computer networks, financial transactions, weather forecasting, understanding climate and all that kind. So the, it, the list goes on and on yeah. and on. Also med how they're making certain medicines kind of essential that they're... In the future, yeah. yeah. So already we're, we're talking about that there's experiments to manufacture drugs and medicines, as you say, on the space station. It, some things are better manufactured in, in, yeah. zero, in zero G and, and so on. So, But even now, it's so integrated with our society that if we lost that infrastructure, we the, the, it would literally, the civilization would grind to a halt. Yeah. So we're, we're already completely entwined with it. Mm. And, and I think, so we make a mistake when we think of space as science fiction. It's really not. It's, it's part of, the, I did a, a discussion with someone the other day. I was going to say argument, but it was a discussion. <laughs> about, and, uh, about, and, and they said, um, you shouldn't think of the, you, we talk about the space economy, which is growing. And we're thinking about things like mining asteroids and putting power stations in space and so on. And then the Earth economy. But they said, no, it's just the economy. It's all the same. We're, we're expanding outwards. Yeah. We're already near Earth orbit is completely entwined with everything that we do. So yeah. it's becoming very important, yeah, actually, to, to manage it as well and to regulate it. To, to, to make sure it's not the Wild West up there because it's essential to all our lives. Yeah, well, exactly. And I guess also like looking at how, you know, meddling with asteroids, for instance, putting power stations on certain other planets is going to impact everything. It's going to impact. I mean, it, yeah, it's, I mean, uh, asteroids. So there's mo the resources. There's an argument which a lot of the people, the early sort of, uh, evangelists for space. There's a guy called Gerard O'Neill, uh, later a guy called Robert Zubrin, who influenced Elon Musk quite heavily. And they all had this view that the what we're putting too much pressure on the planet, obviously, which I think everyone agrees upon, about resource extraction and so on. But the thing is that there are resources, an infinite amount of resources up there above our heads, yeah. if we can access them. And, and and a lot of the early sort of pioneers and thinkers felt that that would relieve the pressure on Earth. And it would, in principle, if you can do it. It relieve the pressure on Earth because you're not fighting over resources on Earth. Yeah. You, you, you've, you've realized that you can just go, go to that asteroid, that asteroid, that asteroid, the moon, Mars, and so on. And it often sounds like, as I said before, it sounds like science fiction and naive. And it maybe was in the 70s. You know, maybe it was rather sort of wishful thinking. But it sort of isn't now. Yeah. It's coming. Um, and so I think there's there are great benefits to be had from moving into space. And it gets a bad name sometimes because, you know, we all know about the controversies around some yeah. of the people who go there and space tourism and all those things, which would be fun. I'd quite like to do it. But obviously it's a, you know, whatever. But actually the the real potential there is to allow us to expand as a civilization without damaging the planet. Yeah. That's the yeah. potential. It seems like it needs to rally alongside us actually just taking care of the planet as well. Because I think, yes, you know, absolutely, we can see how that could be the future of us and not annihilating the planet that we're living on. But equally, will that make people even more apathetic? Like, oh, we don't need to worry about Earth because we can just go up there and go to an asteroid and nick but, something off of that. And that's definitely not true. No. So the thing to say... And this always has to be said, you're right, at the same time as it's talking about the potential of space, is that 
this planet is the only one that we can live on in large numbers in the way that we do. It's perfect for us because we evolved on it. So it is the best place in the universe by far to be a human. Yeah. And that's just a statement of fact. That's mm -hmm. the way that it is. So, yes, we can build colonies on Mars and the moon first, probably. And there'll be a few hundred people and maybe a few thousand people. But it'll be horrible. It's not <laughs> yeah. a nice place. No. Mars, and it never will be a nice place. No. You might have some nice greenhouses and some big sort of buildings. But imagine living your life confined to a building. Mm. Uh, there are not going to be rivers on the surface of Mars anytime soon. No. If it's all, you know, even if you can terraform the planet in hundreds of years time, it's just not nice. So we, we have to remember that as a human being, this is the best planet in the universe because we evolved on it. Mm -hmm. And there will not be a replacement. No. I mean, you started a global um, sort of summit with all of the world leaders giving this quite punchy <laughs> statement that like this is it and and you were saying you know even they were kind of perhaps mm. assuming you would turn up and go like have a great time chatting about yeah. leadership guys and actually you delivered some extremely punchy facts that they needed to hear what i said to them was that so we could ask the question how many civilizations are there in a galaxy like the milky way or specifically in the milky way galaxy and the answer is we don't know so it's a big galaxy 400 billion stars most of them have planets, so there'll be trillions of planets. There's an estimate that there might be over 10 billion potentially Earth-like worlds in the Milky Way galaxy. So there's a lot of places where life could begin and evolve. But on this planet, it took 4 billion years, roughly, to go from the origin of life to us. And 4 billion years is a third of the age of the universe. And so many people I speak to make the argument that that might be unusual. It might, it might be microbes on Mars and all over the place. But if that's what it usually takes, which is what it took here to get things like us, there's probably very few planets which have been stable enough to allow life to live on them for four billion years. So what I said at that climate summit was to the world leaders was, let's imagine that we're the only civilization in the Milky Way galaxy. Just a working hypothesis. Might not be, but might be. So let's imagine that we are. And let's imagine that you, being the leaders, through deliberate action, which would be something like nuclear war, or inaction, like you know, failing to address the climate crisis or whatever it is, you, you cause this civilization to be damaged or even removed from the Earth. If you do that, then each of you may be personally responsible for destroying meaning in a galaxy of 400 billion suns, potentially forever. Have a nice meeting, <laughs> was my it's message It's the best intro them. ever. Which is true. <laughs> you know, the thing is, I think it, oh, we don't so know good. if it's correct that, but it's possible. Yeah. So I think it's just, just let's work on the basis does that, terrify that there's you? nobody else. That terrifies me, that thought. It sort of does. There's a very famous quote by Arthur C. Clarke, you know, the great who wrote 2001, amongst many other things, who said that either we are alone in the universe or we're not. And both of those are terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> so which choose the one that terrifies you the most?